Hello and welcome back to Infamous Indie. I'm your host, That Dead Girl, and if this is your first time joining me, uh, basically what I do here is I sit down and I share with you all a true crime story from my home state of Indiana. Before we get started this week, I definitely just want to say thank you to everyone who tunes in and listens to me ramble on about true crime. Um, you guys are awesome. I was actually pretty surprised that my last video about Judy Kirby has over a thousand views right now. So thank you guys. That's so fucking awesome. And uh, I just really, really appreciate it. True crime is something that I've been passionate about for pretty much my entire life. So to have like an outlet to sit down and share these types of things with people and have people respond is pretty awesome. So again, thank you very much. And moving on from the Judy Kirby story this week, we will be talking about Stephen Judy. The Stephen Judy story has actually come up quite a bit when I reach out to you guys and I ask you, you know, what do you want to hear? So I was pretty interested to get into this case as I wasn't very familiar with it. I'd actually never heard of it at all until it was brought to my attention by a few friends. And with that being said, let's just get right down into it, shall we? Stephen Timothy Judy was born on May 24, 1956, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Stephen was the only son of Vernon and Myrtle Judy, and it's said that he grew up in a very violent household full of sex, crime, abuse, and alcohol. Now, not a lot is well known about what Vernon Judy did for work or anything like that exactly, but what is very well known is that he had a very extensive criminal record and was constantly in and out of jail. Stephen's mother Myrtle was a sex worker. Um, she would often exchange sex with men for money and um, it said that she would actually bring her clients around Stephen and he'd actually witnessed her and her clients together on several occasions. And most people who were around Stephen when he was growing up would tell you that this type of lifestyle was all that he had ever known. Stephen once told a story about a time when his father came home to find his mother in bed with one of her clients. Stephen's father actually responded to the incident by butchering the family sheepdog with a kitchen knife. Stephen would also go on to say that there were times he could recall his mother pulling out a gun on his father and threatening to shoot him. So needless to say, Stephen Judy has already witnessed a lot of things that no child should ever see. And with that being said, Stephen Judy would begin his journey into darkness at a very early age. When Stephen Judy was around 10 years old, he actually got caught burning down his neighbor's garage. And just a few days after that incident, he was actually accused of stabbing his classmate with a compass. By the age of 12, Stephen Judy was experimenting with drugs and alcohol, having sex, and his favorite pastime was shoplifting. And by the age of 13, he began exhibiting aggressive sexual behavior. In fact, there were multiple occasions where Stephen had been caught in the act. Um, he would basically stalk and follow young girls and wait until they were alone. And then he would kind of tackle them down to the ground and attempt to molest them. And as I said, you know, Stephen Judy was caught doing this several times, but nothing ever really came of it. He would just be released back into the custody of his parents with absolutely no consequences. And as Stephen grew older, his attacks just became more and more vicious. When Stephen Judy was just 13 years old, he would end up knocking on the door of a young woman's home, and her name was Carol Emig. Stephen was actually dressed up as a Boy Scout and pretending to be doing some sort of fundraiser. So Carol, seeing this young boy, you know, dressed as a Boy Scout, she lets him in. No sooner than Carol closed the door, Stephen had pulled out a knife and had pushed her back into the bedroom. Once inside the bedroom, Stephen would wrestle Carol to the floor and begin sexually assaulting her. When he was finished, he would go on to stab Carol with the knife numerous times. And as he was stabbing her, he actually used such force that the knife ended up breaking off in Carol's sternum. So when the weapon broke, Stephen ran off into the kitchen, um to actually search for another weapon. So Stephen's in the kitchen searching for another weapon and during this time Carol actually manages to pull herself up and kind of crawl down the hallway. She looks up and she actually sees a hatchet propped up against the wall that she and her husband had just taken on a recent camping trip. So she grabs the hatchet. 
but by this time, Stephen's already storming down the hallway with a butcher knife. So Steve and Judy ultimately decided that this hatchet was a better weapon choice for him. So he throws down the butcher knife and he gets into a physical struggle with Carol over the hatchet until he's able to take it away from her. He brings the hatchet down over Carol's head, actually fracturing her skull. So Carol, you know, she's putting her hands in front of her face, you know, attempting to defend herself. And as she does this, Stephen comes back down again with the hatchet and actually cuts her thumb off. Carol would end up suffering over 40 stab wounds, you know, and a multitude of other injuries. But miraculously, Carol would actually go on to survive. As a result of the attack, Stephen Judy would be detained at a juvenile detention center. From there, he would be transferred to Central State Hospital, where he was diagnosed as a sexual psychopath. He remained at Central State for more than two years before being released and placed with a new foster family. Stephen would go on to be fostered by Robert and Mary Carr, who were actually never ever informed of Stephen's violent past. And while he was never violent with Robert or Mary Carr or the rest of the children in their family, um, his violent behavior did actually continue and Stephen Judy was constantly in and out of trouble with the law. In July of 1975, Stephen Judy would be walking down the street and just so happened to see a woman getting into her car. So he decided that it would be a great idea to pull this woman from her car and start assaulting her. And this attack only stopped because um, a passerby actually intervened. And in this incident, Stephen would be arrested and charged with aggravated battery and would end up serving 20 months in prison. And just one month after his release on the aggravated battery charges, he would actually go on to attack another woman who was getting into her car and try to sexually assault her at knife point. He would go on to spend a year in jail for that crime until his trial ended in a hung jury. Two months later, Steve and Judy would end up being arrested again, this time for entering a convenience store, brandishing a weapon and robbing the cashier. And for this crime, he would just simply be released on bond. So as you can see time and time again, Steve and Judy is committing these violent acts, these violent crimes, and each time he's getting barely a slap on the wrist. And soon his brutality would reach new heights, ultimately landing him on death row. On April 28, 1979, Steve and Judy would follow 21-year-old Terry Chasteen driving south on I-465. In the car with a young mother were her three young children, Misty, Mark, and Stephen. At the time, Terry was basically just on her way to drop her kids off with the babysitter before reporting to work um, at Marsh Supermarkets. Now, it's said that basically Steve and Judy kind of waved or signaled Terry Chastine on the highway as if to wave her to the side of the road to pull over. So Terry sees this and she actually ends up pulling off to the side of the road with Steve and Judy pulling in right behind her. Stephen gets out of the car and he approaches Terry and basically says, you know, hey, your back tire is a little wobbly, you know, that's very dangerous. Can I help you repair it real quick? So Terry basically just thinks that Stephen Judy is some sort of good Samaritan just trying to help her out. So she gets out of the car and retrieves a lug wrench and hands it to Stephen. So Stephen fixes the tire and then he actually goes on to offer to take a look under the hood just to make sure that everything's in working order before Terry gets back on the road. And as I said before, Terry just thinks he's a helpful stranger, so she agrees to just let him take a look under the hood to make sure everything's okay. As far as Terry can see, Steve and Judy is just a normal guy helping out, but what she actually doesn't see is that when Steve and Judy opens the hood of the car, he removes a coil wire from the vehicle. So now, mysteriously, as Terry gets back into her car to start it, it won't start. The car is, like, completely dead. And, you know, Stephen just plays it off. He's like, oh, man, you know, what a bummer, what a shame. But guess what? I'm here to help you. I will take your children to the babysitters, and then I will actually drop you off at work as well. So basically at this point, Terry Chasteen, being a single mother, and, you know, back then there were no cell phones or anything like that, she really has no choice other than to accept the help of a stranger. And from there, Terry and her children pile into the car with Steve and Judy. And as I'm sure you've already guessed, um, Steve and Judy did not take the children to the babysitter. And he did not drop Terry Chastine off at work. Instead, they ended up at a little 
deserted kind of countryside spot next to White Lick Creek. And obviously Terry Chastine at this point is getting a little worried, you know, she's like, I have to really be at work, I can't be late, you know, my babysitter's expecting us, and Steve and Judy just kind of convinces her to just take a load off. You've had a rough time, you've had a rough day, you know, just take a second to enjoy nature and walk with me for a little bit. So they arrive at White Lick Creek, and they get out of the car, and Steve and Judy actually directs the children to a path and tells them to start walking. He kind of gives them a little bit of a head start, I guess, and then he and Terry Chastain actually end up following the path behind them. My guess is as to why he's doing this is to get to a point where the children are far enough away um, so that he can actually reveal his true intentions. Once Steve and Judy could see that the children were playing alongside the creek and were far enough away, um, the situation began to quickly escalate. Steve and Judy began to rip at Terry Chastain's dress tearing fabric from it. He then held her down and began tying her hands and feet behind her back with the fabric from her dress. He would then go on to rape and strangle Terry Lee Chastine while her children played along the creek in the distance. Moments later, the children returned to see their mother's nude, lifeless body lying on the ground. Fearing that the children's screams and cries would attract the attention of passers-by, Steve and Judy began to pick the children up one by one, tossing them into the icy creek. And as you can imagine, um, in November in Indiana, it's very, very cold. And the area of the creek that he actually threw these children into was about seven feet deep. After Stephen Judy, you know, threw all of the children into the creek, he would then go on to toss Terry Chastine's body into the creek as well, with her hands and feet still bound behind her back. So obviously suspicions arose when um, Terry didn't show up at the babysitters to drop off her children and nor did she show up for her shift at work. And only a few hours later her body would actually end up being discovered by some mushroom hunters. And when they actually came upon her they said that her legs were resting on the side of the creek bank and the rest of her body was submerged in the water. Morgan County Sheriff's Robert Williams and Dick Allen were the first to arrive on the scene. The investigators working the scene were still trying to absorb this horrendous discovery when someone actually shouted from downstream, we just found two more bodies. And by mid-afternoon, all four bodies had been retrieved from the creek. Thankfully, numerous witnesses had actually seen Terry Lee Chastain and her children with Steve and Judy that day. So he would actually go on to be apprehended within the first 36 hours. Steve and Judy immediately confessed to the rape and murder of Terry Lee Chastain and he also confessed to the drowning of her three children. And one thing that I definitely found very interesting about Stephen Judy is the fact that he really kind of tried to take responsibility for what he had done. In most cases with serial killers and things like that, you know, a lot of the time they won't even admit that they've done anything wrong to begin with. Um, you know, they file appeals, they do whatever they can to try to get out of trouble and not serve their time. So basically, what kind of sets Steve and Judy apart from some of these other criminals is the fact that he didn't want any of it. All he wanted at the end of the day was to die. He would even go on to tell his attorney, Stephen Harris, that he wanted to make sure that that would be the outcome of his trial. And with that being said, this was actually a very, very quick trial. And during the trial, Stephen Judy actually asked to address the jurors. I mean, and basically what he said next literally shocked everybody in the courtroom that day. He told the jurors, basically, you better vote for the death penalty because if you don't, one day I'll get out and it could be you or your family that I hurt next. And with after only 30 minutes of deliberation, the jury granted Stephen Judy his wish and sentenced him to death. Reporters would go on to ask Stephen Judy how he felt about his execution sentence and he simply just said, I'm very calm about it. I've actually been looking forward to it. And even though Stephen Judy's attorney tried to get a last minute reprieve to, you know, forego the execution, Stephen Judy was adamant that this is not what he wanted. And when asked why, he would just simply say that 
if he was ever given the opportunity to get out into the world again, he would absolutely commit these same crimes. And on top of that, Stephen Judy would actually go on to halt all of his appeal processes. As a result, there was no delay, no stay of execution, and no prolonged years on death row. Stephen Judy's defense attorney would also go on to say that, you know, on the last day right before his execution, um, Stephen Judy would actually end up expressing feelings of regret and remorse, and he actually cried on two separate occasions. Once when he got to say goodbye to his foster parents, and then again, you know, right before the execution began. Stephen Judy's last meal consisted of prime rib, lobster tails, baked potatoes with sour cream, a chef salad with French dressing, and he also requested four canes of beer, but um, was actually denied the beer. Stephen would then thank his lawyer and begin to say goodbye, you know, kind of reassuring him that this was the right thing to do and that he shouldn't feel guilty about it. Right before Stephen's execution, though, it did appear that he had kind of a change of heart because he left his lawyer with one last piece of advice. If you ever have any other clients who wish to do it like this, please talk them out of it. Stephen Harris would go on to never represent another inmate facing death row ever again. As Stephen Judy made his way to the electric chair on March 9th, 1981, he would be the first inmate to die by electrocution in Indiana since 1961. Stephen Judy's last words were, I don't hold no grudges. This is my doing, and I'm sorry that all of this happened. Stephen Judy's foster father, Robert Carr, and his attorney, um, Stephen Harris, were the only two people present during his execution. His attorney stated that Stephen basically just reared up, his fingers clenched around the arms of the chair, and when the voltage stopped, Stephen's body just relaxed. It's important to note that right before he was executed, Stephen Judy would actually go on to admit to several more rapes and murders. He confessed to the slayings of three women in New Orleans, Louisiana, one of which he had actually kidnapped and raped and thrown into a swamp. He had actually said that he wasn't even sure whether or not she survived. He would then go on to admit to another murder of an Indianapolis woman in 1978, as well as two other incidents of rape, one of which he actually admitted leaving tied to a tree in a heavily wooded area, and he wasn't sure um, whether or not she was dead or alive when he left her. So, yeah, wow, that is the story of Stephen Judy. It's just really crazy to sit here and think that this man throughout his life was able to hurt so many people time and time again and just always seem to slip through the cracks. It really makes you think um, how different things could have been had someone actually taken the time to reach out and get Stephen Judy the help that he needed. And I'm really not sitting here talking to you right now trying to have, you know, sympathy for the devil or anything like that. Um, Stephen Judy was a terrible human being. And um, anyone who can take the life of a child, in my opinion, is probably one of the most evil types of people in the world. I don't think people like Stephen Judy deserve any kind of mercy or anything like that. So definitely... Don't get it twisted. This isn't me sitting here, you know, making excuses for him. But time and time again in doing these stories, I have to come to terms with the fact that in a lot of these cases, I just think about how much could have been avoided had people simply reached out and, you know, helped these people. I don't think Stephen Judy would have necessarily grown up to be a sexual predator or a violent offender had he not been exposed to all of these things as a child. And what's even more sad is the fact that Terry and her three children have lost their lives just because, you know, the world chose to, you know, turn a blind eye to Stephen Judy and his crimes. Thank you guys for tuning in and hanging out with me this week. And as you all know, next week we'll be starting part one of the Sylvia Likens story. Um, not to sound weird, but I'm really excited about it. And it is going to be um, a multiple part 
episode, if you will, just because there is quite a bit to cover. I really hope that everyone that watches is enjoying what I do here at Infamous Indie. And if you do, please, please, please feel free to share my content. You know, definitely hit like and definitely subscribe to my channel. I kind of, as I've said before, post pretty sporadically, but I do try to at least get you guys a video bi-weekly. So definitely always be on the lookout for new content, especially this month. And I'm planning a lot of special things for the month of October as well. So with that being said, stay spooky, keep it creepy, and remember, watch your back because it's a crazy fucking world out there. <laughs>